So today I'd like to talk about um, inductive biases in deep learning. Um, and this is uh, basically work with the University of Amsterdam. Right, so the, um, <clears throat> so basically I, I want to talk about this paradigm or this, this dichotomy between uh, sort of in machine learning. On the one hand, uh, there is the people, that basically all of scientists except us, um, who are modeling their specific sort of field, which is they write down models of the physics or the sort of the medical, you know, uh, dynamics or whatever what you have, they put all their expert knowledge in these simulators and these models, and then they study those. They look at the parameters maybe that they can infer from those and then they interpret them. Uh, like this galaxy, this, this, this simulation of these two colliding galaxies. And we, machine learners, we have this other paradigm, which is basically you could call black box uh, modeling, where you just oops, throw a whole lot of uh, data at a problem. You have input and you have output. There is some complicated, uninterpretable black box in the middle called the deep neural net. And uh, you train it to map between input and output. Um, and this is a completely different paradigm, right? Um, and so how can we bring these two together? Because on the one end, the modeling paradigm, there is a lot of expert knowledge you put in, like centuries of knowledge acquired by physicists is going to be put in that simulation of that, uh, these galaxies. Um, and, um, and so can we, so the, the main question I want to ask today is can we put this inductive biases, this, this knowledge, this expert knowledge, maybe back into the black box? Um, and so there's be two parts mainly. Um, one is symmetry. So if we know about symmetries in the world, can we include those symmetries in our neural nets? And the next one is about the generative process. So if you know how data got generated, can you then put the, this, 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 this knowledge about how data get generated back into your neural nets? Um, so first a few examples of uh, you know, some success stories in the medical domain or the medical imaging domain. Uh, where basically the black box paradigm was used and with surprising success, right? So this is a study that came out in 2017. A bunch of Stanford uh, sort of scientists, researchers, they decided to collect a large data set of, uh, of skin lesions, um, including their label, and they trained uh, a neural net, and then they got like surprisingly good results. In, in fact, the results, uh, for instance, from melanoma detection uh, were on par or better um, than the dermatologists themselves. And you see many of these stories appearing nowadays where on a very specific, well-defined domain where you can collect a large data set that in fact uh, you can train a machine to do better than a human expert. Here's another one. This was in the Dutch news. Um, it says computer can uh, recognize cancer better than the pathologist. Um, and a pathologist looks at these types of images, uh, very large gigabyte type images, uh, many, many cells. Um, they have to scan over them. And like in a small part of that image, there may be sort of cancerous tissue hiding and they have to find it. So it's a very tedious task, obviously, um, ready to be automated. And then, you know, many groups um, have now started to model this, to automate this process, including Google, but also University of Nijmegen has, has been instrumental in this. Um, and they found again that uh, basically um, on this very specific task, the algorithm could do better than the human derma, uh, pathologist in this case. Here's a third example. This is retinopathy, looking at sort of a, sc a scan of your retina and um, trying to figure out, see seeing if there's lesions there and trying to figure out whether somebody has diabetes, for instance, right? Again, these types of curves, in this case, I would say machine is not necessarily better um, than a human, but on par. Okay, so then you can ask yourself the question, so what have these problems uh, in common? Um, now, first, the first interesting thing is uh, that, in fact, uh, they all use one type of neural net. In fact, it's the same neural net. So for these three very different uh, mo uh, models, they started off with this Inception V3 model. This is trained by Google, um, basically on your you know, vacation pictures and your house, your family pictures and, st and stuff, not on medical images per se, or at all. Um, and uh, so they chop off some parts of it. For instance, the final classifier is being retrained on the images of interest at that point, and maybe a bit of fine tuning, sort of deeper in this neural net that some of the other things also get adapted. 
But they all start from this one thing. And it's kind of surprising that you can transfer these models from very different domains. You start from one domain, and you move them to another domain. And with a bit of fine tuning, um, you can actually make them work really well. To me, this was sort of a surprise. And then another interesting aspect of this is that this domain is actually pretty much rotation invariant. So uh, if you rotate a skin lesion or a pathology slide or a, retinal, a picture of a retina, it basically is the same. It, it, it could have been another data image. Um, and so what's interesting is that that's a insight, I would say an inductive bias, that a deep neural net is not using. So a deep neural net uses something else, which is translation variance. So if you detect something here, you could equally have well detected it somewhere else. Um, and this translation invariance, or equivariance as we call it, is actually encoded in a neural net by the fact that you're doing a convolution. Um, but, the, but here, in fact, um, these rotation variance is not encoded um, in these neural nets. So this is a piece of information that we have about the world that we're not using. And the paradigm in machine learning is if you're not using a piece of information that you that's true, um, then you need more data to learn you know, the, the, the patterns that you're looking for. If you put them in, then you need less data. And even worse, if you put something in that is actually wrong, then of course, in the beginning with few data, it can help, but with a lot of data, it can actually hurt, right? Because the real world is more complex than you could imagine, um, and you could see it with the data, but you block it from seeing that because you have put it, you've hardwired it in your model. So it's a subtle, Sort of, uh, sort of equilibrium, but I would argue that this rotation equivariance is one that we can safely use. Okay, so um, so we can ask our questions: what what makes a convolutional neural net actually so effective? Um, and the one thing is, you could argue is uh, this idea that you do weight sharing. So instead of having like the number of neurons equal to the number of pixels in one layer, fully connect them to the next layer. Um, that's a huge number of parameters that you would have to train, right? So by the fact that we say that things uh, are translation equivariant, that some object could be here as well as there in the image, we can save massively on the number of parameters that we're training because now we have a little patch and we just scan the patch over the image and it's the same patch, which is the same detector which is being used everywhere in the image. And it's not like I have a different detector here and a different detector there. They're the same detector. So there you can already see that using inductive biases will create less parameters and therefore you can learn faster with, with uh, fewer data points. But there's also a more subtle thing, which is this idea of equivariance, um, which is that, so first of all, let's say, could we replace equivariance with invariance? And um, so they argue, we argue no, because if you would say, try to detect a human being and you wouldn't care about you know, where the eyes are and where the noses are and their relative positions, then this Picasso image would be a perfect human being, right? Because there's eyes and there's noses and there's a face and there's hands, but they're sort of rel scrambled relative to each other. And with a model that's invariant, you would argue that that would actually be fine. So we actually want to retain these relative sort of uh, orientations and positions of all these, these things. And so then uh, equivariance is more something I will explain more. Um, but the idea is that if you, if you change something in the input, you say you move it or you rotate it, and you create, <coughs> you create all these feature maps, then you would also like to understand how these feature maps change. And you know, for translations, you'll see it's just translations of the feature map, so that's very simple. For rotations, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but you would like to control how these things change. And the reason is that if you, let's say, if you train a detector um, and you want to use that same detector for an image and a rotated image, right, then if, if the filter responses change dramatically when you rotate the image, then you have to train a completely new detector for every orientation, right? But if you could rotate your detector, then you could use the same detector at the next layer as well. And so that's the power of equivariance that we're going to exploit. So here's a little um, example of um, what equivariance means for translation. So on the, on the left there, you see the, f the first thing is the, is this working actually? Yeah. So, uh, so this is your filter, this is your image, and then we're moving a bar in the image. And if you look at the filter response after doing the convolution, uh, you see that the filter response also nicely moves. 
So that's what we call equivariant, right? Now look at the rotation, so now we are rotating a bar. Now look at the filter response. The, it's not just that the filter response rotates. In fact, the filter response changes dramatically, right? Here's two small bars and here's two big bars. Okay, so this is not rotation equivariant. And here's a much older uh, sort of case of that, um, where I, you know, some, some images created by Jan de Koel a long time ago. So here you see a four model of MNIST where we move four over the image, and you see that all the filter responses beautifully trans translate as well, where if you rotate it, you look at this thing, and it actually doesn't uh, sort of stay, it doesn't rotate, right? It it's rotates, and it changes a lot. Okay, so the lesson there is if, you know, if there is symmetry in your input space exploited, you're already doing it for translations, why not doing it for other symmetry groups as well? And so one answer, and I should really say that this is only one answer, there's now much more sophisticated you know, models, and I would encourage you to read a number of papers that we've written, and other groups have written on this as well. Um, but this is by far the simplest one to explain, to create equivariance under rotation. So this is the normal uh, sort of convolution. Now what we do for rotation, and now we just use one, the group is rotation under 90 degrees rotation, equivariance under 90 degrees rotation. So there's only the, the group only contains four elements, but we can do you know, groups with you know, infinite elements, which is full rotation group. We can actually do translation um, and rotations in three dimensions, so we, so we can do much more than this. Um, and actually it's presented at this NIPS, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, Okay, so what you do is you take your filter, you move it, and you create this filter map, and then you rotate the filter map, and then you create, so you rotate the filter, and then you create a new filter map, right? So look at this thing, it flips, now it's rotated, and I start over again, and then I create a new filter map here. So these are basically four copies of the filter map where you rotated the, um, you know, the filter. And then a little bit of math, this is the most mathy slide. Um, so, you can think now of a, you can define now a new convolution as follows. <coughs> <coughs> so think of a convolution first of a translation operator acting on an image. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I've been sick the last two days, still a bit coughing. So, um, so you take the, your function f and you, oper you act on it with a translation operator, which basically shifts the image. So as you see here, and then you can define your convolution as basically taking your filter, translating it somewhere in the image, and taking the inner product with the, with the image at that point, and then recording the result. So that's a function of S, which is the translation. Now, when you look at you know, rotations, you would now first define a rotation of an image, which is basically the, the image, but at a rotated X. So that basically m rotates the f to the left. And then you define your, um, your convolution as follows. You, um, so this is only for rotations now. So you take your filter, you rotate it under your group element g, and then you take your inner product with your original image, and that will give you your, your response, your convolution, at the value of that group element g. So in this case, there are four answers. If you rotate over four, the, uh, 90 degrees rotations, you get four answers here. Of course, you will have to add also the translation group. So then you have four full filter maps. So how does that look like? So let's look at this image. So here we have the filter again. Now we have this, uh, this L-shaped bar. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply, we're going to rotate the image. And here are our four filter maps, right? So this was created by taking the filter, you know, and convolving, rotating the filter and convolving, rotating the filter again, convolving, and rotating again and convolving. So you get, this is our four filter map response to our convolution. But now if we start rotating the image, then you get this interesting structure where um, uh, if you look, if you try to trace it back, so this guy goes here, and then here, and then here, I hope it's, I'm doing it in the right direction, or maybe it's in the other direction. It's hard for me to see from here, but so it rotates through. It rotates inside of itself, and it rotates through these four filter maps. So the point of this is that we have now actually figured out precisely how 
um, you know, the, how the response, how the filter maps response under a rotation of the input image, which is our equivariance. So basically, it means if I take um, so if I take a, uh, a, a image and I rotate it, which is what's happening here, and then I take my filter map, that must be the same as taking the filtered image and then acting with it with this operator. And this operator is a little bit more complicated. This operator r rotates internally and sort of cyclically permutes through this list. So it looks a bit complicated, but that's we have now precisely defined what it you know, what this equivariance means, and now we can start exploiting it. But there's been a lot of follow-up work where, you know, we do think much more generally, but um, that's not for now. And uh, so the reason I'm also talking about this, of course, is that we have applied this idea to, uh, to digital pathology. Um, so this is actually a dense network, um, and we have a pathology in input image, and we use these four rotations, so we get four filter maps. Um, and uh, basically, we do all of, all of this equivariant under rotations. So this is just a, you can just take a normal convolution and then replace it with this, this, with this rotation equivariant convolution. And then you can look at the results, and they really improve. So this is human performance. Uh, this, is the, this one is the normal CNN, uh, or dense net. And then this guy is the one with rotation equivariant convolution stuck in. And this is the number of data points. So, you, so here, with which you have many data points, it doesn't make all that much difference. We also use data augmentation, by the way, for this. Um, but when you have fewer data points, the differences get, get bigger. OK, so this is um, being, so this is uh, presented at this NeurIPS uh, for, uh, it's, it's three-dimensional steerable, uh, both under three-dimensional rotations and tr translations. And uh, maybe if this runs, yeah. So here's a interesting little movie. It takes a little bit to boot up. Um, this was created by Mario Geiger, by the way. So this is like a, you know, a, a chair, and these these are the responses of the filter maps, um, scalar and vector responses. <coughs> And then you can stabilize basically the the original image. You can rotate this guy back, you know, after you know after you've done all the uh, you know the the convolutions. And then if it's equivariant, all of this should remain stable. It shouldn't change. And you can see that's beautifully equivariant. And then in the next part, you'll see that a normal 3D CNN is actually not equivariant to rotations. And that's what you see here. So here we ro rotate this. These are the filter responses of the neural net. And if you stabilize it, then in fact, things are still changing around. So this means this whole thing is not equivariant. <coughs> <coughs> and the next uh, sort of layer will have a hard time figuring out what's going on there, right? Okay. Okay, so that's uh, so that's rotation equivariance. Then there is another thing I'd like to talk about, which is also sort of in the you know field of symmetries, if you want, which is um, which is convolutions on graphs. Um, so if you take a normal convolution, um, on, so this is a normal graph, like an image, right? It looks like this, but sometimes your data looks more like this, and I'll have an example in a minute. And so the question is, can you do things like a convolutional neural net on data that looks like this? And there is actually a lot of data like that. <coughs> so there is uh, social networks, World Wide Web, protein-protein interaction networks, citation networks, knowledge graphs, recommender systems, and I'll show in a minute an example. It's a nice medical example as well. Um, so in a normal, you can think of a convolution basically as a node collecting information from its direct neighbors. And these neighbors, they send messages to this node. And for a normal convolution, these messages can be different because the orientation is always fixed. And you can collect sort of different messages from all your neighbors. You can, and you can learn these messages clearly because that's your filters. Now, if you look at a graph like this, the problem is that you know, 
Um, but if I so if I shift this guy to the to, to the right, then of course it's going to be the same messages, right? There's going to be the same filter, you know, mo, you know, weights here that that are sending these messages. But if you if you take a, a graph like this, then you know, one guy has like three neighbors and another has four neighbors. So how are you going to deal with this? Well, and then there's the ordering, right? I mean, I could sort of take this ordering, maybe clockwise ordering. But the problem is that um, if you look at this thing, then, you know, this is actually the, th the same thing, right? I mean, this or this is sort of the same graph. Um, and, I, and if I just rely on the ordering, then I'm going to send the wrong message. So how are we going to deal with this fact that, I, you know, the ordering of your neighbors basically is arbitrary. It's a set. It's not like an ordered vector. Um, and also the number of neighbors can change. Well, the, the solution is surprisingly simple. It's called the graph uh, convolutional neural net. Um, you'll just have to send the same message. Well, it's not exactly the same message because these values can be different, but it's these weights here that will have to be shared across all of your neighbors. And you think, oh, that's really stupid because now you cannot model anything anymore. This is surprisingly powerful, actually. Um, so, and, and, and uh, you, can, you can send a different message to yourself. So there's two types of messages that you can send. So it's basically, uh, you have your state at a node, h, you multiply it by the weight, you do some normalization, which takes care of the fact that some, you know, there's a different number of neighbors you have. Uh, you send a message to yourself, you add everything up, so that's perm permutation invariant, and then you do a norm, uh, sort of a nonlinearity, and then you do many layers of that. That's, that's all there is to it. It's a very direct generalization of a, of a convolution. And um, so one way you can train such thing is sort of in an unsupervised setting, which is here you have your graph, and my task is to, to do link prediction, to figure out where there is links between nodes. Right? So there is uh, so there's this graph. Uh, I take my input x, I take my connectivity matrix A, I do a graph convolution on that graph, I get some latent variables z for each one of these nodes. You can call this an embedding of your input nodes. And then, um, and then there is a phase where you take these, uh, these, uh, these vectors, maybe you take their inner product or some other sort of decoding function, and then a sigmoid, and then you predict whether there is an edge here, yes or no. So now you have a system that you can train basically unsupervised to do link prediction in a graph. A very simple example of that is a, a recommender system where, you know, there's, uh, we all know it, right? So there's um, I, uh, per people here and there's items there. People interact with some items, but certainly not with all of them. You can represent this as a graph. Here is uh, people, here is items, and a person is related to it, of, of connected to an item uh, with a link, and the link has a value, which is how much this person liked that item. So this person hated this item, and this person really liked this item, right? It's a very sparse graph, and it's also bipartite. Okay, so now what we can do is we can basically use this particular thing to do recommender systems, uh, so recommendations. So we can now try to figure out what the value of that thing is by predicting whether there is a link between these two nodes and also trying to predict you know, what value that link has using the method that I just showed. But since we're in the medical imaging uh, conference here or um, workshop here, um, so this is work with, um, with Marlene as well and uh, and uh, Regaf, Selvan. Um, so this is uh, the problem of uh, detecting or segmenting airways out of a lung CT. So uh, basically you start with this image of a lung, or, well, of your lungs. Um, then there is some pre-processing which, you know, make, gets local measurements um, on, the, on the airways. And then you need to figure out, you know, what is the graph? What's the underlying graph which connects all these nodes? Okay, so... Um, the first thing you do is you do sort of an over-segmentation, which means you, you connect many, many to many of these nodes. And then there is, uh, basically you run this graph convolutional neural net on this graph here to try to prune out basically the various um, uh, un unwanted uh, connections and maybe insert more um, where they're needed. And so that's, that's exactly this graph convolutional neural net which does link prediction which is completely similar to what we do for recommendation systems. And it's quite surprising because this works very well. So, so this is uh, the, so these are two error measures. Uh, this is the previous, I would say, yeah, I'm not sure if it's completely state of the art, but at least pretty good. 
Um, and then these are two versions of this idea. This has actually a lot more model in it, sort of human knowledge in it. And this model is completely trained as a black box. Um, and um, in this case, the black box sort of won out, I would say. Um, but you can, you know, the results are actually very good with this new method. Okay, so the last part, how much time do I still have? So the last uh, part I want to talk about, okay, is um, inverse modeling. And in inverse modeling, um, you take, a, say, say, a clean image and you know what the forward model is. So you know how the clean image results in measurements. This could, you know, in simple, you know, simple example could be you blur the image or you add noise or something like that. So there's some forward model, and let's assume we actually know this forward model. Right? And then uh, you need to figure out the inverse. So you look at the measurements and you want to figure out what that image was. So here's a bunch of examples on MNIST. So you have these two things. You have pairs of these two things, clean and, uh, and sort of measurements. And you start with the measurement and you have some iterative process to reproduce kind of your final estimate of the clean image. So in this case, it's sort of a super resolution, you could think of it. Okay, so uh, one way you think you could do this, which is a certainly a reasonable um, sort of approach, which is uh, you create lots and lots of pairs of clean and dirty images or clean and measurement is images, and you just train the best sort of neural net that you know, in this case, uh, maybe a UNet, since, since the author is here in the first row. Um, so you take this, uh, you take this unit and, um, and you train it and you see how well you do. But note that this unit actually does not take the generative process into account. You know what the generative process is, but you haven't embedded it in this neural net. Um, there's, much, there's many really cool problems like this, uh, many more than I anticipated. Um, and here's, for instance, one which is you have an image of the sky uh, that you're trying to decode. Uh, you do measurements, which are always in the Fourier domain, and since you do the measurements with lots of telescopes, which are just points, you have a very sparse subset of those. Um, if you do an inverse Fourier transform of this, you get this very dirty reconstruction, and then you need to use deep learning magic to get back to that. And it turns out that's exactly the same for MRI imaging. You take a, you know, an MRI you know, image, you do Fourier measurements using different coils, in the Fourier domain, you sparsify them, and then you do an inverse, which doesn't look all that good, and then you have to reconstruct, you know, clean it up. I also wanted to uh, show you very briefly this. It's a plug for a paper by, by these astronomers, and I think Yashar gave a very nice talk um, in the Bayesian Deep Learning Workshop. Is Yashar here, maybe? No? Um, so what they did was set super cool. That's why I want to show it. They basically took this idea, the recorded infrared machine that I will um, actually uh, talk about in a minute, and they used it to decode images which were lensed by gravity. So you basically, uh, the original image is like this. You basically know how to get from here to here. That's a gravitational lens, and the task is to take this and go back to that image. And they did this in a wonderful way, using deep learning. We will now focus on the uh, MRI uh, sort of reconstruction, so again, there's a Fourier transform in this direction, actually, and there's all these, also these, these coils, so there's many, many of these. Um, then there's a subsampling step, um, because you don't measure all the frequencies, but only a small subset of them. Um, and then you want to go either from here to here, or you do first do sort of a dirty reconstruction by doing the best you can with an inverse Fourier transform, and then you clean it up going in that way. And the way we're going to do that is by using learning. So if you look at normal methods, or the methods that are used currently is they actually don't use, um, they don't use learning at all. So they basically have some kind of prior, which looks like maybe sparsity inducing prior or something like that, that compressed sensing. But what we actually we know we can create a lot of these pairs, right? We can, we can take an image which is measured at many frequencies. We can delete a lot of frequencies. We now have a lot of training cases, how to get from here to here. And we can just train that map. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. And in addition, we also, since we also know this process, this measurement process, we're also going to embed it in the model. Because this looks a bit complicated, but hopefully you can get something out of it. So the idea is to basically treat this as an RNN, a recurrent neural network structure, where at every iteration, you do your best to reconstruct the image. So X is the reconstructed image at time T. 
there is some RNN function f that takes in the previous image. It takes in sort of a hidden state, like a memory state. But it also takes in this here, which is actually the gradient of the log probability of the measurement given the estimated image, and treats it as another input. Um, so this is basically showing you where are the errors. So if I take this particular reconstruction and I go through my measurement process, what would my observations look like? If they're very different from the real observations, something must be wrong. And then I want to feed that information back into the neural net. And the way to do that is to take the gradient with respect to x, which tells you the sensitivity. Where in the image are you making mistakes? Now you have an error image, and you stick that back into the, sort of as an input to the next neural net that you're going to use in this process. So this looks complicated. Um, at, every, at every time you have a reconstruction error, and if you have ground truth, you can backpropagate gradients through that. But at also at every time you have this sort of, I try to predict my observations, I take a gradient, and I feed it back into my model. The model itself is basically uh, convolutions and a GRU because you do sort of like an LSTM type update and uh, more convolutions, you know, the typical thing you would do um, as an engineer in deep learning. Um, so maybe I can skip this in the, in, well, maybe just look a little bit at these images. It looks a bit complicated, but it's the same as the last one. Um, so the error image is here. So you can sort of, you can see, I hope you can see it too, this is the error image which is fed back into the system, which, which tells you exactly where you still need to work on your, uh, on your reconstruction. Okay, and then um, for some experiments, so we look at, we use these three data sets, um, which are, this is a T1 weighted brain images from a three Tesla scanner um, at one millimeter resolution. Then this was T2 star weighted brain images required at seven Tesla. 0.7 millimeter resolution, and then this is knee images, completely different. Um, T2 weighted knee images acquired at a three Tesla scanner again. Um, so this is like a subsampling protocol. So you start, so these are all the Fourier measurements, but then you're going to sort of remove more and more of these Fourier components and in order to uh, to do the reconstruction, and every time you have to compute less of these Fourier components, you will speed up your MRI imaging process, right? Because uh, if you reconstruct from this, or if you don't have to acquire this many Fourier measurements, uh, then, you can, uh, then you can speed up your measurement a lot. And the goal that we're after is actually doing real-time imaging, because there's these machines now which do imaging and uh, therapy, radiation therapy at the same time. And if you're in a, in a system, then uh, I would think of it this way. So if you're trying to radiate, right, and you're breathing, you know, you're all over the place. You're hitting healthy tissue, um, and you're not hitting the sort of the bad tissue. But if you can do real-time imaging, right, you can sort of correct for it. And if you're breathing, you can move the, the, the beam with the breathing, and then you hit the bad tissue all the time. But for that, you would clearly need real-time imaging. So that's what we're working on. So here's a visualization of it works. So um, this is the uncorrected. This is RAM and this is the target. So you want to be close to this. Um, this is what you would do if you don't use the learning part of it. And now uh, you can clearly see it's a lot better. Um, this is as the RAM, which does iterative reconstruction, iterates to the solution. Here's the error. This is the target. And this is the RAM. So here it goes. One, two, three, four, five. And the error basically is gone. Um, so here's a comparison to uh, UNET um, and also across different domains. So this is kind of interesting. So you can train, see it's hard for me to see, but you can train on the, the first one is trained on brain uh, T1. The second one is trained on brain T2 star. The third one is, is trained on knee MRI. And then uh, the purple ones are the best UNET that we could train, um, but then tested on all the other data sets, right? So on both on the, all the brains and, and, and the knee. And what you can see, first of all, it's better because we use this generative model inside. And the other thing which is really nice to see is that you can train on one domain and still do very good in the other domain, right? So the transfer from a knee to a brain, which, yeah, it's kind of surprising to me. You can train on a knee and then test on the brain and it still works pretty well or very well actually. So this means that it's really figured out something about reconstruction MRI images in general. 
and not just overfit it on a brain image. So here's a few more comparisons. Um, below is the UNET reconstructions, and here is the, uh, the various uh, uh, so RIM reconstructions. Yeah, so this is trained on a knee and tested on a knee, so this should clearly be the best one for both. Okay, so to conclude then, um, so CNNs are perhaps by far the most successful thing in deep learning, um, and that's because they use a very important piece of information, which is translation equivariance. <coughs> <coughs> and um, we should really try and strive to put more of known inductive biases in our deep learning methods. And so uh, one thing that I talked about is symmetries. There's many more groups that we know that we can stick into the convolutions, and they have very interesting um, sort of improvements they show. Um, and we have looked at uh, graph convolutions, where you know, you know that the, 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 the sort of structure you have to deal with is a set rather than um, sort of an image. Um, um, and, and, and more generally, perhaps, is that if you actually know the whole generative process under which the data is generated, you should not ignore it. You should not just encode it in the pairs of images um, that you're creating. You should actually try to embed that immediately into your neural network, and the REM was one way of doing that. Thank you.